Good afternoon, everybody. Today we have a very special lecture in our series. We have an excursion to Toravere Observatory, observatory uh, in a virtual form. So our program today is, is that, uh, uh, well, I introduced the program, then our new director, Ante Tam, will give a greeting from director. Then we have the uh, presentation from Anna Aret, uh, who will introduce, give you an overview of the observatory and the telescope, if successful. Then, then Anna, then we have the different working group presentations. Anna will present the stellar physics group. Then I will present the cosmology and galaxy physics group. Then we have space technology by Henrik Erpais. And uh, then finally, uh, Krista Allikas will present the remote sensing group. So this is our program today. And uh, I give the floor to Antti. Please go ahead. Antti, are you there? Yes, hello. Great. Yes, yes. So welcome to Tartu Observatory, which is the main space research center in Estonia. I'm Antti, and my duty here is to keep this institute working. So I'm actually very happy that you are interested in astronomy and space, because in addition to being so exciting, the space is in many ways also the key to different challenges we are facing here on the Earth be it security, the environment, or bringing down the cost of a high-tech society. And of course, space science also opens so many opportunities to develop our understanding of who we are, what we are, what is this everything around us, the universe, and where does it come from? So I hope you will enjoy this virtual tour and that one day you can come to visit us physically too. I also hope that you will see that people working in space science are actually almost normal persons. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Antti. Okay, then uh, Anna, please go ahead. Uh, I'm Anna Aret. Uh, I hope it is not very noisy. I'm trying to shield my microphone from wind. It sounds good. Uh, I am standing on the top of the main building of the observatory. It has been my second home for more than 30 years already, since uh, 1989, when I was graduated from uh, physics department of Moscow University. And I show you something more interesting than I am. So we are now looking east. And here you see uh, a village of Teravere. Uh, it was built after the observatory here in Teravere was founded in the beginning of 60s. Uh, far away, if it is possible, maybe you see the um, uh, church in Neo. I'm moving slowly south. And this is a road which you one day, I hope, will take uh, to, to come to observatory. And the observatory here, it was built, as I said, in the beginning of uh, 60s because uh, the light pollution in Tartu became uh, too strong and uh, astronomical observations in, in the old um, observatory were not possible anymore. Now I will try to move to uh, west, but it will go over the sun. So probably picture will, uh, no, it was not, wasn't that bad. So you can see some uh, domes, but the main dome is behind those trees. And I will walk to that uh, dome to show you our 1.5 meter telescope. And hopefully it will not be raining at that moment. So I will be able to open the dome and show the moving of telescope. Uh, usually uh, excursions are not taken up here because there are several instrumentation up here. And also, uh, well, the rooms I will be passing now are not that aesthetic because they're technical rooms. And then I hope that my picture in the phone will not be jumping too much, uh, making you nervous. But I'm going now down. 
to to the main building. Uh, I will try to do it as as fast as possible. Uh, well, uh, and um, the observatory here was built in absolutely empty place. There was just an empty hill, a field, nothing else. But this place was uh, chosen uh, because uh, it was uh, one of the uh, driest places in Estonia. Uh, it is shielded from clouds uh, by, from east and west by two big lakes, uh, Lake Petrus and uh, uh, Wurzjerv. And it is also somehow elevated a bit. So the height of Duravere uh, Hill is full 72 meters over the sea level. And I must say that it is not the um, lowest situated observatory in the world. I think the Vatican Observatory is uh, just on sea level, uh, some, something else also. Uh, and uh, well, I find it a bit funny that in Estonian language, the word Maggie is used both for the Turaver Hill and Magnificent Everest. But uh, now uh, uh, we have three floors here, and uh, I am going to the second floor of the observatory, where is the only part which has remained in this building as it was in 60s, because in 2011 and 2012, the whole observatory was uh, demolished almost completely. There were only outer walls uh, and, uh, and uh, floors were standing. It was actually pretty heartbreaking picture how it looked like in between. But now we have a fully renovated building and this piece of art, this uh, stone mosaic, this is the only thing which actually preserved it was not possible to move it from here because it was created here. And it shows uh, constellations in the way uh, Estonian, uh, ancient Estonian imagined it. So, uh, for example, uh, you see here some birds. You see the bird, I hope. Yes. Uh, and uh, Estonians call the Milky Way, not a Milky Way, but a bird's way, Linnute, because in spring and in autumn, it is exactly in direction of migration of birds. And uh, uh, some other things, well, uh, this is actually Orion, but I don't know names of these instruments in English. They are used uh, to, to, to harvest uh, well, anyway, uh, also Pleiades up there. Uh, there are um, Puchiasuel. And the northern star in the center, it is called Puchia Nile, which in uh, literally translation means a nail in the bottom. So in the bottom of a big pot, which is over us. And now I think I will go uh, through the uh, new part, which was, uh, yeah, we have a nice exhibition here. We often have uh, uh, some exhibitions of photos and paintings in the main building. And uh, some new parts were built uh, to the observatory uh, during the renovation. Uh, and uh, this corridor is actually above our new labs. I hope that space uh, physics, uh, yes, space uh, technology department head will tell you about the new labs which were built. We have here big, uh, nice rooms for uh, conferences uh, and uh, for uh, concerts also. And now I am approaching um, visitors center. Visitors center is also a new part of the Mm, observatory building. Uh, above it, we have um, uh, guest rooms fully equipped with kitchen and everything, even sauna. And here in the visitor center, there are models of real, real size models of two satellites. This is Proba V, and there, if you can see a little one, this is a cube one. It is just 10 by 10 
by 10 centimeters. And now I'm going to take you uh, to the uh, to the um, big dome, as we call it. So it is a dome of 1.5 meter telescope. And on the way, we'll be, we'll be uh, passing through the park, uh, which has now some attractions uh, for uh, visitors. Uh, we have a very active visitor center and family days. I don't know if, it, if we are going to have family day this year, but they have been extremely popular. This is a wonderful place to work and to live. So I moved uh, to Turavere, well, more than 10 years ago already, and I still uh, enjoy the surroundings very much. Uh, well, I'll try to uh, walk a bit faster. Mm, I am a bit blinded by the sun, so I don't see actually what I'm showing to you. Uh, yeah, so this is from outside. And the first uh, images you saw, I was showing from the very top of that white dome. Okay, uh, let's go further. I thought that it would be interesting to see everything like uh, in real life, uh, not yes, just the good. photos on a presentation. So if you have a bit shaky image, I hope you will forgive me. Uh, here along the uh, road to the big dome, uh, there are some uh, pictures showing uh, the uh, scales of different things on Earth, uh, like, uh, or around Earth, I would say, uh, like uh, comets and then come um, asteroids uh, and so on. The sizes, I will not show them in uh, very much details. And the uh, scales go up to the uh, big, uh, big scale of the universe. So there is still one picture which I would like to show you because I think it is very lovely. Uh, it shows a, a light echo of Monocerotti star. Uh, it is, uh, uh, well, in many places you can Google it uh, because it is really very nice place. Uh, Tina Limetz in our observatory, she has been studying this star. Uh, now here you can see uh, a dome which is uh, on the right of me, uh, which is not used actually. Uh, the telescope was lost somewhere in the uh, I don't know, Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or something, some, somewhere there. So, uh, yep. Uh, but the next dome, which is standing on a um, post, uh, this is a dome of 60 centimeter telescope. It's a Zeiss telescope and it is used for photometry. So it uh, has been actively used also now. And from there you start already to see uh, our big dome. Uh, and fortunately it is not uh, uh, raining now because some half uh, an hour ago it was raining. And here close, uh, nearby, you see a model of a solar system in uh, real sizes, not the distances, but sizes. So the uh, first here, the small one is a Mercury, then it uh, comes Venus, the blue one is uh, Earth, and then uh, Mars and the bigger planets, uh, they're not even a full uh, spheres because they're so big, but the sizes are actually uh, like in, in, in right proportion. And uh, further there, you can see a small uh, dome. It is a semi robotic uh, uh, telescope, a little one, uh, 30 centimeters, and it has been also very actively used. Uh, and on a field, uh, there is a field of, um, um, oh, weather center. No, no, no. How, how was the right word for this? Meteorolo meteorological station. So if in some news you hear that, or you read that uh, temperature in Tartu is that and that, don't believe it is a temperature in Turavera. So it is actually one of the oldest 
stations in Estonia. And we are approaching um, my dear love, <laughs> big, uh, big telescope dome. Uh, there is 1.5 meter telescope there, which has been actively used uh, for spectroscopy. Uh, at, uh, now mostly for uh, study of massive stars. Uh, our department uh, is mostly uh, uh, devoted our uh, time and efforts to study of massive stars, uh, particularly in uh, the um, later stages of their evolution. Uh, because they are more, most puzzling, and there is the, since we, we, we know the main uh, path of evolution of stars, uh, but there are many surprises, and uh, the most perplexing stages are massive stars uh, in evolved states. Uh, actually, we don't know how they um, uh, are connected with the theoretical uh, evolution tracks. There is a full zoo of different types of stars. And uh, well, we don't know who is a, a child of which one and uh, uh, how they are connected evolutionary. And we don't know also about the processes in stellar interiors. Uh, the evolutionary models actually uh, can be checked by observations, uh, but this. Um, uh, so traditional methods like photometry, spectroscopy, interferometry, uh, they only show uh, what we see outside. So we say that, okay, if a model gives the same outcome as we observe, it should be more or less okay. But what happens inside? What are the layers inside? Where is convection? Where is burning? Uh, how uh, how the uh, star functions in, inside? This cannot be uh, said from the traditional methods, uh, but fortunately there is a, a rather new direction in astronomy. It is called asteroseismology. Uh, it started as um, um, helioseismology and uh, well, even before it is the same way as um, uh, geologists uh, study uh, earthquakes. Uh, to see what uh, to, to find out the structure of uh, Earth. So it's the uh, same technology can be used uh, to record uh, stellar shakes, different type of stellar shakes. And, uh, and from that, uh, comparing with uh, complicated uh, three-dimensional models, we can have uh, uh, more or less direct information about um, structure of stars, inside structure of stars. So it, I think it would, would be the most difficult part of the universe to observe, to see inside of a stars. So uh, here uh, we study these uh, stellar quakes, uh, stellar oscillations. Now I am entering uh, the dome. I think that Laurits Ledier, who is our senior researcher, was so kind to open it for me already. Uh, here is also an exhibition for a Stellarium, which is used uh, uh, also for um, educating people and uh, excursions usually come here to see uh, what is in our Stellarium. I will shortly drop in there. Oh, yes, Laurits has put lights on. It is so lovely. So, thank you very much. Yes, and the entrance to the Stellarium is, I think it's very pretty. And here we have several uh, things. <laughs> you could play here with a model of sun and earth and moon movements. Uh, and there are some posters explaining what is what. And here is a model uh, of a Mars surface and also a Mars globe. And in the corner, you can see my, probably the most valuable, uh, I mean, in, in, in money. Uh, Part of the exhibition. It is a piece of uh, uh, meteorite. 
this uh, piece uh, is 270 kilos, so it would be really difficult to steal it from here. Uh, this meteorite came down in 1947, and the biggest piece of this meteorite is in Moscow. It is 1,745 kilos, uh, and this is a metal. So it is uh, like a solid metal, I cannot even shake it. Well, probably, no. I, yeah, I can a little bit shake it, the stand, but I couldn't move the meteorite. And in the other side, as you see, the room is like a circle because in the center is a, a part which holds the telescope and it is detached from the outer part of the dome. Uh, so uh, mm, the movements of the dome won't shake the telescope. Here, usually you can see uh, some planetarium uh, shows. And in the back side, uh, for me, it is the most interesting part uh, of the, mm, but it is a darkness there. Well, I will not go in, but it is an uh, exhibition of the historical uh, computers and parts. And there is even a Apple II computer, which is still functional, which is absolutely unbelievable for me. Uh, now I will go up uh, to the dome. Uh, my phone is slowly dying, but I will. Ho I hope that it would still survive uh, a little bit. I have a backup. Uh, I have also a tablet which is sitting in my backpack. Uh, so okay, uh, two more floors up. We have a comparatively Anna, high Anna, dome. Anna, Anna yeah? sorry. Uh, the door you see now, that's our band room. Can you have a look to show it? Oh, a band room. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Sure, I can. We, we have an observatory band. Uh, we practice here and before the virus, we used to play in Barlova uh, once a month. Uh, I hope we, we can continue in the fall. Yep. Drum set. Here it is. Drum set. Here it is. Keep here watching. it is. So the rehearsals can be here and the music is very loud. <laughs> I have been observing a couple of times when someone practiced down here, but it is not bothering me. So I said, okay, go on. Uh, I like loud music. <laughs> I like Rammstein, so I won't right. be disturbed by anything here. Yep. Uh, this is a piece of equipment which I like, particularly a microwave life savior during night observations. But uh, now I will still go one floor up for, for the dome. You have 12 minutes. Yep, I think that would be enough. Uh, as I already told you a little bit about our uh, stellar department, I would also tell that we would be very happy to have students, not only physicists, or study astronomy, but we have a particular need in, in people who know something about um, we technology. Lost, we lost the picture. Ah, low battery, 20%. Nope. Okay, it came back. <laughs> yes, because I said that die. I hope that 20% is still all right. Uh, Yep, I go to turn, to open the door. This is a room. Okay, start. I have a remote for moving the telescope, but actually I don't need it much during the observations because the telescope, it was um, uh, built in 70s, but it went through a series of upgrades and uh, now it's going to be noisy because I am opening the dome and this is a telescope. My dear baby, I do love it with all my heart. And this telescope and there are little uh, telescopes which attach to it and actually when excursions come and they say Oh, oh, we uh, looked at the skies with a big telescope. Nope, 
uh, tele, they can only look through this small attached telescope because uh, focus of the main uh, 1.5 telescope is uh, actually uh, used by this blue thingy. Uh, it's a spectrograph. It is attached to the Cassegrain focus of the telescope and uh, we can take uh, spectra uh, of um, different stars and learn about uh, the characteristics of those stars. Particularly, I am interested in pulsations of blue supergiant stars. For that, we need uh, a rather long time series to find out the frequencies and from that the pulsation modes and then we can draw some conclusions about the inner structure. So as I said, it is, uh, uh, we have now one uh, student from uh, informatics who is uh, doing his uh, master thesis uh, on uh, um, uh, upgrading the pointing system of the telescope to going to the, uh, to the right star. So I need to, my both hands for a moment. So I turned on the remote. Uh, we have a computer system which, um, mm, where I can enter the star name and uh, say go and it goes to the right star. Uh, but here I can show you the movements. Uh, where is the better angle? Perhaps, perhaps here. It has two uh, directions, uh, right ascension and declination. Uh, I am moving now uh, up, it is in declination. And uh, now I am moving in uh, another direction, which is uh, mm, right ascension. And actually I could push two buttons at the same time, but I cannot do it with one hand. So you, you won't see the movements of both. And I think that you won't have, I won't have time to show you inside of the mirror, but well, maybe still two minutes. Seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes, ah, wonderful. Then I can show it. I will first, uh, I have here, uh, to put a C telescope to the home position. Oh, I need to turn off remote. So, go. No, it doesn't want to go. <laughs> okay, let's activate it here. Try once more. Yep, now it is goes. And I will go up. It is the most dangerous part of the observations. Uh, removing and putting back the main cover. And I would desperately want someone, I mean uh, some uh, master student, who would uh, build an automatic cover for this um, telescope because okay I am tall and strong I can remove it I can put it back but I had some uh, girls students here for whom it was a really big challenge but I still need both of my hands so I will put my phone on the edge here I have no idea what you are seeing at the moment I hope it's not very bad So now you can look inside and what you see is there is a mirror and you have uh, also a reflection of a secondary mirror inside. 
because the uh, light comes uh, from, uh, from here, where I'm standing, to the um, telescope. It reflect, is reflected from the main mirror, and then it comes, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, um, turning the, the light uh, to the second mirror. And the second mirror sends then the light to the spectrograph. So the, all the light which comes from the, the big uh, opening here, it is concentrated into a small point. So we uh, measure then the spectrum of this small point. And uh, yeah, that is more or less um, everything I wanted to show you. This is this telescope and the big dome. And actually a very nice picture of a sky. I prefer it actually without clouds. I like how the clouds look like, but uh, yeah. From professional point of view, it would be better if there are no clouds. I think that now, uh, if you have some questions, it's time to ask. Yes, we have a few minutes. Actually, uh, there's one question in the chat. Could you answer? There was a question about uh, uh, about the age of this meteorite you showed. Uh, when, when did that ha that happen? Land to Earth. Uh, no, uh, that meteorite which I showed. Yeah. It was in 1947. I I, oh, I okay. guess. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please, if you have some questions, uh, please ask now. Uh, Okay, well, uh, so it's uh, said that it's so heavy, 247 kg or something. So which type of metal, uh, metal, metal is this? Uh, uh, this is mostly iron uh, with some addition of nickel and a little bit of other things. Uh, that's it. This is a piece, big piece of iron with some additions. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there more questions? Uh, yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, I was wondering uh, how the Starlink satellites of Elon Musk, uh, if they are complicating your work, like if the light pollution is uh, increased due to those like uh, satellites? Or uh, what's your well, at the, <laughs> at the moment, not yet. Uh, I think the light pollution from Tartu and from Elva Mm, it is much worse and we have been really carefully uh, looking uh, on the projects of uh, uh, building um, some light on, a, uh, on a roads here and I should say that the ministry uh, who is building roads, they have been very cooperative on that, uh, taking into account uh, our um, requests, uh, but these, uh, these uh, satellites, well, actually, they are posing a problem for photometry. Uh, photometry is when you, uh, take a, um, when you take a photo, actually, and you need to measure uh, brightnesses and changes in, in the brightnesses in the series of photos. Uh, but in spectroscopy, when you just point a telescope at one star, uh, then, uh, then these satellites are no problem. But they are really problem if you do a, a wide, uh, uh, wide sky uh, surveys uh, with the telescopes which take a picture of a big part of the sky at the same time. Uh, well, in, well, they take a, a picture of a big piece of a sky and there is a, Mm, software which has been elaborated to detect the uh, transits. I mean the objects which appear and disappear. So the software will be really confused by the satellites and will create a lot of false alarms. Uh, but for spectroscopy it is not such a big problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, time for one, one final question. Okay, thanks, Anna. That, this was wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hope to see you someday face-to-face. -face. No need. 
Okay, let's move on. Okay, I will now present uh, uh, the cosmology group activities. Okay, in Taravere, we have uh, our group has 16 people currently, and uh, our leader is uh, Professor Elmo Tempel. And to put in one sentence what we are doing, it would be this our group studies the large scale structure of the universe. I hope you remember from earlier lectures, I told you something about the large scale structure. With this word, large scale structure, we mean galaxies and bigger. The uh, systems that galaxies are form, forming, galaxy groups, uh, galaxy clusters, superclusters, and finally the cosmic web. <coughs> and galaxies, they, they have very important uh, place in observational cosmology and in our work. Uh, bas uh, basically because they are the building blocks of the visible universe at the large, large scales. You, you notice the word visible because I told you about the dark matter also. That's, but that's uh, more, difficult to, more difficult to observe. So that's why galaxies are important. And galaxies are important because they trace the underlying dark matter backbone of the, of the universe, which, which actually dominates the large scale structure. And galaxies are relatively easy to measure. Uh, so so that, that, is, that is our angle. Uh, galaxies are relatively easy to measure and they give a hint about the actual large scale structure dominated, no, dominated by dark matter. Uh, I, I gave you, uh, I told you about this large scale structure, the cosmic web. We have this uh, net sort of net kind of structure. We have this filamentary, this long uh, narrow uh, uh, things f filled with galaxies and dark matter and intergalactic, mat ma intergalactic matter gas. Then we have these voids, huge empty regions. Uh, quite empty regions, and then importantly, in these crossing points of these filaments, we have these these uh, super clusters and galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies. They are the nodes of this uh, uh, network. And if we zoom into this crossing point, then we have, for example, Virgo supercluster. Uh, this kind of structure where we have this, we have our Virgo cluster here. And some other clusters, and then if we look uh, look a bit closer, uh, deeper, we see our local galactic group, where we have where our Milky Way galaxy is and Andromeda galaxy is, and finally we are then in this picture uh, in small point here in this Milky Way. So this is roughly speaking the uh, domain that we are working on, the large scale structure. A few words about uh, how we do it, the data. Um, um, <coughs> uh, we, we are working with spectroscopic surveys. Let me explain this. Uh, so the very basic data that we use for these large scale studies is uh, galaxy distance, galaxy positions and galaxy brightness. This is the very, very basic data we, we base our stuff on. Uh, I hope you remember that these galaxy distances, they can be derived from, uh, from uh, via the Doppler effect and the redshift of spectral lines. So somebody has to do spectroscopy of a galaxy, galaxy spect light to, to get the distances and brightnesses. And because, we, we are working on very large scales. It means that we need uh, that we need awful lot of this galaxy spectroscopy. So, uh, so the practical thing is that we need we are using results from large surveys, surveys where some telescope or telescopes they are devoted for mapping the galaxies in some some big big uh, fraction of a big part of the sky, and then we use the results 
uh, from that survey to do our stuff. In recent past, uh, this, uh, uh, we have done a lot of work on this Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This picture here is showing the full sky and this green area, this is showing the Sloan area. So that uh, uh, this is a nice, nice fraction of the sky, 20% of the nearby sky. So this is where a lot of our science comes from. And so in this field, there are uh, positions and uh, brightnesses of uh, well, about 70,000 galaxies. And this is how it looks when we, when we look, look this in a, in a 2D projection. We, we are here and uh, this is a sort of X and Y axis and this is slice of sky. And uh, <coughs> so this is the, oh, this is the, this is the data, data we are working on. And there you already see these large scale structures. You see that uh, see, this is actual data. And you can see these large, large, uh, large structures here, and also the empty regions. <coughs> and and uh, and in this point, let me uh, mention the work uh, of Mar Enasto from our group. Uh, she's studied this uh, this galaxy uh, data, and in particular this uh, this Sloan Great Wall, this this big thing here. This is from her work. Uh, she, she measured the masses and distributions of the galaxies and, and uh, found that there are several superclusters uh, forming this, let's say, hypercluster, super supercluster. This is one example how we, how we do this thing. <clears throat> then uh, another uh, uh, practical way of using this uh, data is is to use the galaxy light distribution because uh, <coughs> this is this picture is showing a slice of sky uh, uh, from the Sloan data where we have uh, taken we have taken the, the light of the galaxies and smoothed it in in three three dimensions so that we get this continuous field and this is already showing the this is tracing the tracing the large scale structure that we are interested in. Uh, this is uh, this is from Johan Lievamäki's work from from our our group. And uh, this uh, Johan's work was important because with this uh, just looking at this light distribution, he could he could identify a large number of superclusters and. He made a catalog of the superclusters, which is very, which is very, very frequently used in 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 the in our field. This image is here showing showing some some of the different different superclusters in the in the data. Okay, then another important uh, way of how we do do stuff is this filament finder. Uh, uh, called Bijou. Um, uh, uh, Nsar, our senior uh, guy, he has been uh, with his collaborators. He has developed this Bijou code for detecting these his filaments of this cosmic web. Uh, this picture on the left shows roughly what we are doing. These blue dots here, they are galaxies. That's galaxy data. This, these are. 3D positions of galaxies. And very roughly speaking, we model this distribution as a cylinder. So that we assume that this, this bunch of galaxies here, they, they are, their, their geometry is this cylinder. And then we do it to another piece of galaxies and get another filament. And then these the filaments are connected. Like here's one filament, here's, an, here's one cylinder, here's another. And so these connected cylinders, they are finally then the, our model of this uh, uh, cosmic web with this data. And this is how it looks in practice. Uh, Elmo Temple uh, applied this method to Sloan data. Again, this uh, 
red with dots here, they are galaxy data. This is the this is a 3D box of of the Sloan data, galaxy distributions. And then these blue lines, they are these filaments that we then find with this visual, this filament finder. It is blue blue uh, blue network that is the cosmic web that, that we extract from this data. And th this has been very very important. This work has been very important for uh, for us, our group, because uh, now that we know where these filaments are, then we can we can do a lot of um, follow up work. Follow up work. We can we can look at the galaxy properties. Uh, how 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 are galaxies outside and inside the filament? And we see we we see uh, effects like uh, like for example. Ted Kutma's work, he noticed that uh, when when the galaxy when, when they when they come from outside when they fall to filament there's this transformation from spiral galaxies to ellipticals. There's something very very uh, interesting happening happening in in that in that process. Uh, another example of uh, science what we get from these uh, filaments is. So on here, this green one is this filament, and then these red things, they are groups of galaxies. Elma found that uh, these filaments, they are quite regularly filled with these the groups, groups of galaxies. That is telling us something essential about the um, structure, structure formation of the large scale structure. Uh, another avenue for our work in, ad in addition to these uh, spectroscopy measurements is simulations. Uh, I told you, uh, I have told you about this, how starting from this uh, fluctuations in the early universe, we put them in computer and let them grow by gravity and put other physics there too. And then finally the structure comes out and we can, we can study the properties of the large scale structure in the simulations in a way that we cannot do in observations yet because uh, observations are limited by, uh, well, they're hard to do. And this is an example of a millennium simulation, one of the big things in recent years. Uh, okay, we didn't do this, but uh, Punya uh, worked on this data and looked, uh, looked at how, this, uh, how these galaxies, how they rotate or uh, their spin direction is related to, to the direction of the filament. It means that there's some, this fila these filaments, they have effect uh, on, the, on the galaxy properties. Another uh, way of, uh, another example of uh, simulations is this eagle simulation. Uh, uh, Tony Tuominen, my student, is currently working on that. <coughs> uh, this is uh, this picture is showing a slice, uh, slice of eagle simulation, and these blue dots here are simulated galaxies. So it just, you, you can see that they trace this similar this cosmic web structure I've been talking about. But now the point in Tony's work is that then we look at the intergalactic mass, the, the diffuse gas uh, uh, between the galaxies and inside the filaments, and this is how it looks. These the filaments, they are filled with this uh, very hot, hot gas, uh, which is shown with this color, color map here. This, this hot gas, this is, this is uh, something that uh, is very, uh, currently very hard to detect, uh, but our point is that with our filament finder, we, we have a way of finding this, finding where this, where this gas is and then later observe it then with uh, x-ray, x-ray wavelengths, x-rays, because this is hot, hot gas and it emits and absorbs x-rays. And uh, the scientific interest is that this, this, uh, this hot gas in these filaments, that is probably the missing baryon uh, uh, component, uh, which is open, open question at the current cosmology. Uh, part of the normal matter, the baryons are missing. And we, we think that it's this hot gas and we want to uh, analyze the simulations to, to then to point X-ray telescopes to, to finally see it. 
uh, x-rays is my 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 special field uh, which i have brought to this to this uh, group here and uh, my time is up and so i won't have time to go to show anything more i just mentioned that uh, we have also people working on 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 the actual galaxies uh, and galaxy physics and uh, uh, in particular uh, uh, milky way also the, our galaxy so that's my story now there's time for a very quick question if you have no questions okay then i stop sharing and uh, visit the chat okay no okay so that's my story and let's move on to space technology with hendrik hi i uh, hope you can hear me i will yes take up the slides also so uh hi my name is hendrik um and i will present to you about the dart observatory space technology department so the name uh, space technology is probably quite uh, self-explanatory so what we do in the space technology department is that we build various uh, space technology instrumentation and also some uh, we participate in projects that are just uh, deal with high tech uh, high-end technology which i will also mention quickly um i will mostly focus current uh, today on uh, what our current projects are and uh, also a bit about recent history so uh, for about me i have participated in various space technology uh, activities now for eight years i think uh, starting with sq1 and uh, kind of uh, participated in, in that project also so and speaking of which uh, so from a more kind of historical uh, point of view the first uh, space instrument that we did uh, through uh, in in estonia as its own mission was sq1 so it's estonia's first satellite it was uh, the project started in 2008 and we launched it into space in 2013. The main objective of S-Cubes is testing an electric solar wind sail, which is a propulsion method that has been uh, developed that uh, is a very effective propulsion method uh, uh, in simulations, but it has not been verified yet because it is very hard to test and it involves plasma physics, which is very expensive to test on ground. So it is even cheaper to make a satellite and send it into space than to actually try to make a very uh, expensive uh, plasma physics experiment uh, on ground. Um, important note is uh, we aren't able to tell, test the full, full E-cell concept even if we send up a satellite to, to Earth's orbit, we need to go further away. But that's for a longer a longer description of the project. And here you can see also the partners on the bottom uh, side, and this uh, hopefully applies to many, many of the different projects I will speak about. But um, I think it might be more in interesting to for you, as uh, most people already know about Escube, so I will try to focus more on other projects. So after Escube uh, was launched, we got an invitation from the European Space Agency to work on a camera system for European student Earth uh, orbiter. And we developed an Im Earth observation imager for it, which is effectively in this mission, it is a camera that uh, aims to take very nice images. So it's a high resolution uh, imager uh, comparatively to other imagers that we have developed. It was launched into space in 2018 uh, unfortunately, the SAO satellite itself has some problems with the communication system, but we have also tried to help solve uh, uh, the communication issues aboard SAO, and we have been relatively successful in helping to get the communication system running for the SAO satellite. Uh, so hopefully there will be more positive news regarding the uh, SAO satellite. Uh, currently, it is kind of in a state of almost working, but not quite. Uh, 
uh, continuing on from SL, uh, um, well, simultaneously with the development of S-Cube, we started developing our competence of, with different laboratories in the observatory. So this can be separated um, into two groups. One is the kind of development labs and the testing labs that uh, mostly are used for uh, for kind of for every everyday activities, it, these include electronics, uh, EMC, which is electromagnetic com compatibility. This is uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Can you, Yuka? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is the electronics lab. This is the EMC lab uh, where you can uh, basically measure. The, uh, the electromagnetic uh, waves that come out from uh, uh, whatever system. So it can be tested if you have any uh, leaking magnetic electromagnetic fields, or you can also test uh, how the antennas radiate energy. Uh, very useful, useful for many space applications and also useful for radio equipment uh, and also used to test those. Then we have um, a separate optics lab, which uh, where we do a lot of optics calibration and testing. Uh, so there's quite many activities in, in that field. And then uh, very space specific, uh, not completely space, spe space specific. We have a thermal vacuum chamber, which you can see on the top right. Then we have a high impact shock bench, which uh, is basically a large hammer that tries to model the, the separation effects on rockets, which create a very large shock impact. So your, uh, your space instrument has to survive these shock uh, effects. So this uh, large hammer is able to uh, basically create a very similar shock condition. And on the bottom right, we have a, a vibration testing bench where we can vibrate our uh, our satellites and small instruments because uh, in addition to shock the vibration conditions uh, are very harsh in uh, when launching something into space uh, you could say that this is one of the one of the biggest challenges in space engineering uh, is this uh, vibration and shock environment and the second largest challenge is the radiation environment uh, but in space technology because you don't have many chances to uh, try something uh, it is very important that when you send something into space that it is likely to work so you need a lot of testing and different testing facilities to actually test if the uh, if the things you develop and prototype uh, work and one additional comment is having such labs is very useful for developing space technology and this kind of competence is also very rare. So it is not very easy. Um, every time we talk with the European Space Agency with our different projects, they are always surprised how uh, good the quality of our labs and different, uh, different measurements that we can provide are, especially from the optics side and the space environment testing, and of course, then also EMC testing. Uh, continuing now is uh, I will talk a bit about ongoing projects. So first, SCUBE 2, which you might have heard about a bit. Uh, it is a three unit CubeSat, uh, so three times uh, larger than SCUBE 1, uh, which uh, you saw a picture of from Anna's presentation. Um, in our team, we mostly are developing the kind of display the satellite platform, so the structure, the electronics, the different subsystems of the satellite, the kind of backbone of a satellite. And then we have very many partners with scientific experiments, which involve, uh, uh, once again, this uh, electric uh, electric sail, uh, ex electric solar wind sail experiment, then, uh, which in this case is used as a plasma break, uh, which is basically used to deorbit the satellite uh, to fight against space debris. Then we have cold gas propulsion, uh, extra two imaging payloads, uh, which aim to take uh, uh, measurements into different specific uh, wavelength bands, uh, aimed at uh, providing scientific measurements using CubeSats. Then we have 
a C-band FPGA-based uh, communication system, which is basically a high-speed communication system for satellites. Then an experiment uh, for radiation uh, coating and uh, science grade magnet magnetometer experiment. Uh, a small uh, video about how the, what the satellite's main experiment, the tether deployment and plasma break testing actually looks like. You make the satellite rotate and you start slowly releasing uh, this tether from a reel and the tether goes away uh, from the satellite and the tension between uh, that is generated using uh, this rotation, this keeps the tether stable. Uh, on SQ1, the thing, the reason why we couldn't fully test electric, the electric solar wind cell effect was that the reel that releases this uh, tether uh, got stuck due to uh, vibration effects. Even though we tested the system, uh, it had some likelihood of failure and unfortunately uh, the, this also happened when, when launching SQ1. Now a bit more about uh, current and future projects. So uh, one project that we have with the European Space Agency is uh, Theia, which is an Earth observation imager, uh, which aims to take radiometrically calibrated images. So this is something that is usually done by large satellites, such as Sentinel-2B. Uh, and this imager tries to do, copy as much as possible from kind of the quality of image aside, uh, but making the imager a lot smaller and therefore cheaper to make. And ideally you can put many of these images on different satellites and get uh, increased time resolution. So you get measurements a lot more frequently. Um, currently this project, uh, currently the project status is that uh, it is being decided if uh, this instrument will launch with one ESA satellite. The decision will come in June, uh, which uh, for us would be quite exciting. Uh, then the next big achievement for our team was that we got selected for uh, as, uh, as one uh, partner for a big ESA mission, which is uh, one of the main European Space Agency's uh, scientific missions, which is a Comet Interceptor. Uh, although the name is a bit confusing, uh, so we don't actually uh, try to uh, land on a comet or touch the comet. It, uh, the spacecraft will go very close to uh, an object that is coming hopefully from outside the solar system or uh, and uh, we will travel near it and take uh, images and other measurements from as close as possible. So this is one of the fastest missions that ESA has done ever. So the project kind of launched end of last year uh, and the launch of the satellite will be in 2028. And we are developing uh, an imager for this mission. And here you can see uh, on the left, you can see the imager. Uh, and on the and this large plate is a shield for for a um, small object that uh, uh, the instrument might hit. And here you can see an illustration of how the instrument will take pictures of uh, this interesting object. In this case, a comet. And finally, uh, uh, we are also working in cooperation with uh, uh, and. Uh, developing technology for various uh, companies. Uh, this is happening through, for example, a, our laboratories work together with a lot of companies and in the space tech group we have a larger project uh, dealing with unmanned ground vehicle autonomy where we test different sensors, we develop uh, localization and visual, visual navigation algorithms. This uh, project is in cooperation with Mirum Robotics. Um, this is it for a uh, um, kind of a quick introduction of all the different projects and activities ongoing in the Space Technology Group. And uh, yeah, there is also a small link uh, where we kind of present 
not all of the information is there yet regarding our current activities, but more and more uh, will be available there and you can already see some things there. And that's it from me. Do you have any questions? Thank, thank you, Henrik. Yeah, uh, a few quick questions, uh, students, please. Nobody wants to ask, uh, and nobody's asking in the chat. Okay, then, okay, thanks. Then we move on. Uh, can you stop the sharing so we can move on? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, okay. Uh, Krista, your turn. Yes, I would start. Yes. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. No, no, so, I, see, I see your face, but not, not slide. Ah, uh, not slides. Let me check. Share screen. Oh, oh. Yes, now it's happening. You can see the slides. Yes. Uh, good. Um, I will, uh, yeah. So, hello everyone. Here is the slide. Where are you now in the end of your tour? So you are still Estonia, still observatory, and, and this is me working in this room. And uh, I'm happy to give you an overview of the remote sensing department activities. So there is a quite large department which consists of four working groups. There is working group for vegetation remote sensing, for water, for atmosphere and the radar remote sensing group. So here you can see the four, four working groups and, and the, their main activity. So for vegetation it's about retrieving biophysical variables. For water, it's uh, determining optical water quality. Uh, for atmosphere remote sensing, it's mainly about the UV radiation. And for radar remote sensing, it's uh, here is example of one application by combi combining passive and active remote sensing uh, uh, data that you can develop this application like monitoring grass moving mowing activities. Uh, so all these four working groups, they closely work with the optical laboratories, also Enric uh, mentioned them. So in, in, these, um, in these laboratories, we have the possibility to calibrate and characterize our radiometers that we use in the, in the field. So uh, here is uh, under the slides, uh, on, on the below of the slides, you can see the main activities in each working group. So we, we do quite a lot of uh, field measurements. So we do the radiation measurements, uh, the in situ sampling, uh, then vegetation remote sensing work group is highly, um, highly connected with the radi radiative transfer modeling. So we do the calibration and validation of data, the theoretical studies, and also uh, in the end, we all try to put this into practical applications, how we can use satellite data to monitor the environment. I myself, I'm from water remote sensing work group, so I, I speak more, a little bit more about this. Uh, so the research, what we do in, in, in here is about developing um, algorithms that are applicable for past, present and future satellites. So we can, we are able to, to analyze changes, the cause of changes in, in the water by using long time satellite time series. We do quite a lot of uh, field measurements from, from lakes, lakes to oceanic waters. We, when we go out and do the field measurements, we also analyze the, uh, the water samples here in our uh, water laboratory. Uh, and uh, when we have this data set that we have gathered from the field and, and also the satellite data set, we can combine these data sets and, and do the spatial, temp 
spatial temporal analysis of uh, water quality. Uh, we are also involved in, in many validation teams, so we give uh, feedback to ESA mainly about the products uh, of, their, uh, of their sensors. And uh, we are also moving towards developing more applications for, for monitoring water quality with remote sensing data. Uh, so our main area of interest is, is lakes. So here are on up, you can see the photo of different lakes and, and how different the color of the water really can be in a lake. And below that, you can see the examples of two lakes in, in southern Estonia, the Vagula and Tamula. So even if the lakes, they are very close to each other, they can be optically very different because the color of the water is determined by the, by the substances in the water that absorb or scatter light. And therefore this um, uh, reflectance or the uh, reflectance is determined. So the signal that comes out of the water is, uh, is determined by the substances in the water. Um, can you see my mouse on the slide? Or if it's moving? No. Yeah, ah, okay, S sorry, yeah. Uh, so yes, here on the, um, Below left is the reflectance that is measured over different water types and, and this is determined then by the substances in, in the water. And this is also the parameter that is measured by the, by the satellite sensors, the, the radiation coming from the water. And uh, so how we give feedback to these um, uh, space agencies is that we go out we do the field measurements, we do the, the radiometric measurements, and then we, we analyze the data. We take our field data on the same day where was the satellite overpass, and we compare it with the satellite data. Uh, this is very important, and the feedback is highly appreciated from the space agencies as the water types, they are very different, and the algorithm, they can work regionally very differently and depending on the water types. So in, in Estonia, we, we can cover uh, quite well these eutrophic boreal lakes. Uh, yeah, in addition to the radiometric data, we, we collect the water samples and we, we analyze the phytoplankton community in the water and we can also determine the biomass in, in the of the phytoplankton. And from the, from the water samples, we can also determine what substances there are in the water and, and what is their con concentrations. So in how, how high amounts they are present in the water. And, and this uh, gives us this data set that we can then use to uh, validate uh, to check the accuracy of these global algorithms of different uh, satellite sensors. But uh, it's even more, more important that we can then develop our own regionally or water type based algorithms. And then we can apply them on, on satellite data and we can see the spatial changes in the optical water quality over small or large lakes. And um, yeah, when we, when we have the ability to use satellite data for our, our lakes, our waters, then we can see how the spatial and temporal changes occur in the lakes. So here is again the, oops, sorry, uh, these two lakes and how the color of the water has changed during, during one year from May till September. And uh, below you can see the chlorophyll A concentration. So you can see that the lakes, they can have quite different um, seasonal patterns. So we are, 
um, working towards developing uh, algorithms to derive different water quality parameters from the satellite data. Here is just one example that we have this uh, OLCHI image, which is a sensor on Copernicus set satellite Sentinel-3. And we have applied there our regional algorithms for estimating chlorophyll A, total phytoplankton biomass and, and water transparency. So we can, in case of cloud-free conditions, we can obtain this information daily basis from the from the satellites. Yes, so here is also one example that we are um, working also to creating syner synergy between different uh, types of data. So here is example of, uh, here is our lake Wurzer, the green one and uh, how the chlorophyll A uh, concentration changes seasonally based on ju just uh, field data. So this is the data we can get from national monitoring program. So it's like one sample per day from just one, one location. Uh, in 2018, we had their autonomous radiometer that was measuring daily basis. So we can see that in lake, actually, the changes, um, uh, there can be high seasonal, seasonal change in the lake. And the more data we have about the lake, the, the more we know about its ecological status, for example. And when we can add here also the satellite data here, the Sentinel-2, every day we can also get the spatial image of the lake. So when we can combine this uh, spatial information and, and temporal information, we can get really good overview what's going on in the lakes based on the, based on the remote sensing data. Here is one example of the application we are working with. It's to, to use Earth observation data to supporting European Union Water Framework Directive. And this is the directive placed on European uh, states, European Union member states, that uh, says that, uh, the lake, that the countries should uh, monitor and report the ecological status of their lakes. And so here is the example, one example of, of Lake Papsi, how we can uh, detect or analyze the, the ecological status of Lake Papsi based on chlorophyll A. So we can get this uh, daily data, we can uh, calculate the monthly means and based on the monthly mean, the the, the vegetation mean, which is then that we can see that based on this data, the, the lake uh, had the moderate ecological status class. So here, this we can done on the, on the lake by lake basis then. Uh, this is a slide about the remote sensing of vegetation. Uh, so in the, in the vegetation working group, they are working uh, a lot with, with modeling data and, and they are also doing the, the field analysis in, in the forests. And uh, they have long time experience with working with radiative transfer models in the vegetation canopies. Uh, in, uh, in the remote sensing of vegetation work group, they are also working with or designing their uh, uh, different radiometric instru instruments to to measure uh, in field and in in the forests to provide supporting data for satellites and uh, there is a strong cooperation with with European uh, space agency and also with with NASA uh, the working group working with uh, atmospheric remote sensing they have specialists specialized with, uh, with on, on UV radiation related measurements and, and also they are working with, with analyzing the, the climate change. So here, uh, 
Yeah, so they are measuring the UV with their own instruments. And here in Tiravera, we have also the weather station that maybe you noticed it when Anna had the tour. It was uh, in the middle of her, her work towards the telescope. And uh, there, there is this Ironet, NASA Ironet station that is measuring the UV. And they are also working with, uh, with Copernicus uh, data, mainly with Sentinel-5 uh, satellite. Yes, so this was very general overview of what we do here in the Earth Observation Department. You are, uh, you can you can visit our our website and 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 also get acquainted with different thesis topics. And if you are interested to have lectures about the remote sensing, then we have various lectures in the University of Tartu that you are all welcome to visit. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, now there's time for a few questions to Christoph. Please go ahead. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So my question is, uh, why they are just um, uh, doing experiment with this phytoplankton? Uh, I mean, there is zooplankton as well. And uh, what is what is the reason behind this? Yeah, we can we can measure the the substances that uh, absorb or scatter light in the in the visible domain. So the it's, um, it's from 400 till 700 nanometers. So if there are substances in the water that interact with light in that range of uh, wavelengths, then we can then we can measure these. And so chlorophyll A is a pigment in in phytoplankton that we can measure because chlorophyll A is absorbing strongly in in blue and in red wavelengths. So by by its absorption, we can we can measure its amount in the water, and and also the the substances they have to be quite on the on the surface. So this is also one one factor why we why we can measure phytoplankton. Okay, yeah, thanks. Are there more questions? Alexandra asked. Um, what is the connection between water observations and space? Mm -hmm. uh, so we are we are measuring the the same parameters than that satellite are measuring. So the radiation coming from the water, and as uh, satellite is providing these global products over the whole Earth, we can uh, we can. We can measure the same parameter regionally and we can compare how well the satellite is actually measuring this parameter in, in this condition, for example, in these eutrophic boreal lakes. Satel so we sa satellites give the large scale structure of water. Uh -huh, Aha, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. as it, okay, as it's your course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's mainly about uh, validating the algorithms that settle, that has been applied on satellite data. Okay, time for last questions. You can maybe ask uh, other speakers also uh, mm -hmm. a few minutes here. Okay, I guess I guess nobody wants to ask. Okay, I thank for everybody, every speaker speaker today and uh, to students yeah i will i will post uh, these videos and material to the usual place you can you can have have a better look uh, in your own time and really if you are interested in any of the topics please uh, please contact please contact uh, me or, or the people that, uh, you see in, in the in the in the slides and there is no homework for this lecture uh, this was special and um okay and um okay next week we have the we have the space news uh, lecture and i will send you later today or tomorrow instructions about it so thank you everybody bye bye